Hi, I'm Michelle Shepard, host of Uncover Charmini from CBC Podcasts. In 1999, 15-year-old Charmini Anandavale disappeared on her way to a job that police believed didn't exist. Four months later, her remains were found in a wooded ravine. I revisit the case that has stayed with me for over 20 years, ever since I first covered it as a cub crime reporter for the Toronto Star. You can find Uncover Charmini on CBC Listen or on your favourite podcast app. This is a CBC Podcast. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. I'm Phelan Johnson. I've always loved looking up at the night sky. As a kid, I remember we would lie in the back of my dad's pickup truck with a bunch of blankets and look up at the stars. If we were lucky enough, we would see a few shooting stars. If we were really lucky, we would see the northern lights. That was back before I moved to the big city. But even here, I can make out some constellations. And I still look up. This week on the show, we're stargazing. Every nation has their own perspective of the night sky, their own interpretation and knowledges of it. And so these Indigenous astronomies speak to a connection to the land and and to the people. And that knowledge has been here as long as people have been here. From Indigenous astronomy to the first Indigenous astronaut, we're talking with Indigenous people who are reframing how we look at the sky. When you think about the night sky, what constellations come to mind? Chances are they're rooted in Western astronomy. But Indigenous astronomy and scientific knowledge have been here for millennia. It's just not taught in schools or considered important within universities. My next guest is working to change that. Hilding Nielsen is Mi'kmaq, and he's a professor in the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Toronto. Hilding, welcome. Thank you for having me. So how would you describe the way astronomy is typically taught in introductory university course? Yeah, so the University of Toronto is famous for having an astronomy course that has about 1,500 students in it. And in that course, it generally starts from the early Greek and Roman astronomies, Aristotle, type of Plato, Pythagoras. And then we'll channel through uh, European astronomy with Newton and Tycho Brahe and Johannes Kepler and Galileo, of course, and into modern astronomy. And it's just this one linear path from the Romans to essentially Neil deGrasse Tyson and today's scientists. It's very, very centered in the European model. And how have you been incorporating indigenous knowledge in your courses? I've been trying to do that little bits here and there. It's Our, our courses tend to be quite full of uh, material, so adding new material is always a challenge. Mm-hmm. But I always want to make sure students come in and and the first thing they see is not their expected constellations. They, I don't want them to see a bear with a tail like Ursa Major. I want them to see the Mi'kmaq constellation Muon or a Cree constellation of the bear or a Haudenosaunee constellation that, that's around the Pleiades. And mm-hmm. to recognize that these constellations reflect the land that we're on, uh, if we're in Toronto or in Mi'kma'ki or anywhere. Hmm. And what is Indigenous astronomy, and you know, how do you define it? Uh, you know, how vast is it, or how old? I define Indigenous astronomy as being the the astronomies and the knowledges of the peoples of the land. So, and since we're in the state, in the eastern state of Canada, I would define it as the the astronomies of the people that were here before settlers and colonizers. So astronomy of the Inuit, astronomy of First Nations, the Mi'kmaq, Cree, Anishinaabe, uh, and so on across across Turtle Island. And every nation has their own perspective of the night sky, their own interpretation and knowledges of it. And so these indigenous astronomies speak to a connection to the land and, and to the people. And that knowledge has been here as long as the people have been here. And so is there a star story that comes to mind for you that gives an understanding of Indigenous astronomy? A great story is the story of Muon and the Seven Bird Hunters, which is a Mi'kmaq story. So if you 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 close your eyes and you're looking in the northern sky and you see what we call in the West the Big Dipper. And if you're looking at the Big Dipper a couple hours before dawn in spring, you're going to see the Big Dipper kind of pointing downwards. So the four stars make up the bear is kind of facing downwards and the tail is climbing higher in the sky. The four stars of the Big Dipper and the bull uh, are Mew and the bear. And then towards what would be the handle of the Big Dipper are the, are the bird hunters. And you go on those three stars to another four to get the seven bird hunters. And the story starts by 
Well, you have to get up early in the morning, a couple hours before dawn to observe this constellation. And when we observe it at that time in the morning, and we observe it every day, we can see the constellation circle around the sky. Uh, the constellation circles around the sky every night as well. So we see there are two different timescales uh, in play. But if we start in the spring uh, at that two hours before dawn, the bull, the Big Dipper, or the bear is pointing downwards. And that's where the bear is waking up from its hibernation and decides it's hungry and needs to go gather food. As the bear leaves the cave, first Robin uh, spies upon the bear, grabs its bow and arrow, and decides to chase it from a hunt. And the story continues, and through the summer, we, when Muon is running across land, so the, the constellation is kind of flat across the sky, and the birds are chasing it. As we get towards fall, Muon is getting tired and stands on his legs to fight back. So the constellation's on one side again. Some of the birds have fallen below the horizon and lost track of the hunt. But when Muon stands on his back, Robin fires its arrow, striking the Muon in the heart and killing it. Blood gets everywhere, all over Robin, who flies into the tree, shakes off the blood, except for one stain on his chest. The leaves are now all red as a result. Chickadee joins Robin, and they begin a celebration to cook the, cook the bear and to celebrate the feast and the harvest. As we approach winter, the constellation is the bear's on his back again and reflecting the spirit of the bear in the sky and waiting for spring to come as part of the next cycle. So we see lots of different kinds of knowledge. We have knowledge of the year as a calendar. We have knowledge mm -hmm. of ritual and ceremony. Uh, and we have connection with nature. So it's not, even, it's not just an astronomy story. It's, it's, part of, it's a story of people and a story of how to be. Do you ever hear pushback to indigenous astronomy? You know, people saying, you know, well, that's, you know, that's not science. That's just a, a, a myth or a story. If I had a dollar every time, <laughs> yeah, uh, I'd be retired. I do hear it a lot. Um, there is a sense in astronomy and physics that as a science, our goal is to seek an absolute truth, to be objective. There is a sense that Astronomy is for all people and benevolent. So when we talk about stories from cultural perspectives, that kind of lies outside of our sanitized version of science, of, of having a hypothesis or a theory or an idea and a test to prove it and experimentation. We don't know how to incorporate these stories into that kind of system or, how, or if we should. And I think for a, a lot of my colleagues and myself who are all trained in this system, that can be threatening. How do we deal with, if we if we claim to work for an absolute truth, how do we deal with that when we have indigenous stories telling us there's other truths and other knowledges and other ways of knowing? And for many scientists, that's hard. We're not trained to think that way. We're trained to think within a certain methodology of approaching science and through approaching truth. That's hard for a lot of my colleagues. And so there is a lot of pushback. And there's a Mi'kmaq concept that you teach to your students, two-eyed seeing. Can you explain what that is and why you think it's so important? Yeah, uh, two-eyed seeing is a concept that's sort of um, brought to the forefront by Elder Albert Marshall and Elder Medina Marshall. The principle is kind of straightforward. It, we have two eyes, and with our two eyes, we get to see depth, and we see you know objects in the distance very clearly. But with one eye, we're only looking through one lens. So we can think of this as Western science as one lens of looking through at reality. And then we can look at indigenous knowledge as, as the other lens. And when we bring both lenses together, we can build a greater picture, something beyond what only one of those can do. So, you know, Western science could do so much, indigenous knowledge is so much, but together we could do even more. Astrocolonialism is a term that's being used in some academic circles. What does astrocolonialism mean? And where do you see this happening today? Yeah, um, I would see astrocolonialism through three kind of lenses. I think the first is historical. A great example of this is James Cook. I grew up in Newfoundland, about 20, 30 minute drive from a statue of James Cook, because he was credited with mapping out much of the western coast of the island. And while he was doing that, he observed a solar eclipse and made meticulous uh, records of that solar eclipse. And when he returned back to Britain, the scientists there were amazed and were very happy. So a couple of years later, when the Royal Academy of Sciences in the UK wanted to send an expedition to the Pacific to observe the transit of Venus, they chose James Cook, and he did that, that expedition to Tahiti to do those observations, while at the same time having sealed orders to, quote, unquote, discover Australia. So there's this intimate kind of connection between astronomy and science and colonization that I think astrocolonialism refers to in one aspect. I think in the modern sense or current sense, it's where our telescopes are. Modern astrophysics relies on biggest telescopes in the world to look for the first stars, to look for evidence of dark matter. Most of these telescopes on the ground are on indigenous territories, whether that's in Hawaii on Mauna Kea, 
southern United States, Chile, Australia, and almost all new construction are being, is being done in indigenous territories, and some of which against the consent of the, of the local peoples. And that creates another sense of actual colonialism. And I think the third form is more of a, a futurism issue where, you know, we want to go to the moon, we want to go to Mars. But the language we have for doing those missions is wedded deeply with the same stories of colonization of the Americas. Very few scholars can talk about how we're going to go to Mars without sort of bringing in American settlers in the West in that same kind of terra nullis in space. And so that creates a third, I think, astro-colonialism that we are um, starting to come to terms with. I think terra nullis is a, is a term that more and more people are becoming familiar with. Um, but can you explain what you mean by terra nullis in space? Yeah, so the concept of terra nullis is the idea that colonizing countries determined the land was empty. So they did this in North America and Australia and all around as a way to dispossess the first peoples of the land and to be able to take it for themselves. And then that principle of saying that the land is, belongs to nobody means that they can, people can come in and claim it and do what they want with it. And we sort of are starting to do that with space um, in the same sense that if Mars, say, belongs to no one, then can companies like SpaceX send rocket ships and uh, settlers uh, and to do whatever they want there or to do asteroid mining for instance mars has been suggested to be a good way to um, you bring asteroids to mars you refine them take all the metals out and ship it to earth you know so how do we determine what rights and what are what is ethical in space if we have a have a that sense of terra nullis in space so you mentioned the construction of telescopes on indigenous land and you know, there's currently a debate around the planned construction of a 30 meter telescope on Hawaii's tallest mountain, Mauna Kea. It sparked opposition from many indigenous people around the world. You wrote an article about this controversy titled Canadian Astronomy on Mauna Kea on Respecting Indigenous Rights. So what prompted you to write that? I think there was a lot of pushback from astronomers as to whether this, whether indigenous rights mattered in the sense, largely in the sense that you know, astronomy is a is not like pipelines. Uh, a lot of my colleagues would say astronomy is benevolent. It's for the people. It's for greater knowledge. Is the greater good. Um, and I felt it was very important that we actually create an ethical standard for how we do these constructions. And you know, as we see across Canada, we don't really understand how to um, deal with issues around consent or no consent. Do you ever feel like you're stuck between a rock and a hard place? Yeah, research in astronomy in Canada really depends on having access to big telescopes. So much of Canadian astronomy occurs because we have access to these facilities. And for people to do science in Canadian astronomy, we have to use those telescopes. If I want to publish papers, I need data. And we go to those telescopes for that information, that data. That's our currency. You know, and if I want to have a permanent job in academia, I need to write papers. I need to publish art journal articles. And that depends on using these facilities largely. So for me, if the 30 meter telescope existed, I would have the ability to apply for observations of planets are going around other stars, looking for the first stars ever born in our universe, to do science that I can't even think about yet. But at the same time, if we don't have permission or consent, how's that ethical? Do I have to choose between being a good astronomer or respecting Indigenous rights? Is that a fair choice at all? And I think in the end, it's just a matter of we have to respect Indigenous rights first um, and worry about 30-meter telescopes later. Hilding, you've given us a lot to think about. Thank you so much for talking with me today. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Hilding Nielsen is Mi'kmaq, and he's a professor in the Department of Astronomy and Astrophysics at the University of Toronto. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. Sky watching on the show today. Coming up, Chickasaw astronaut John Harrington. John was the first Native American to fly into space, and he's dedicated much of his life to encouraging Indigenous kids to follow their dreams. And so I'm grateful that my ancestors gave me the opportunity to walk the Earth and maybe at one time fly above it. Um, and it's my responsibility, I think, to share that with others. That's coming up. When Sharon Shorty sees the northern lights, she thinks about a story her grandmother told her. Sharon, who's Klingit, remembers being a kid in the Yukon, walking around the village of Teslin in the winter and looking up at the sky. My grandma and I, I grew up uh, visiting her and spending lots of time with her in Teslin and walking around at nighttime in the winter. And I always look up and I could see all the ribbons in the 
air. And、um, Grandma would tell me, "Shh, don't look, don't look, bad luck." And it was the Northern Lights. And I was like, "Why can't I look? They're so beautiful, right?" And、uh, she said, "It's bad luck." But she did say that it's bad luck because it's spirits. So when we're looking up at them, we're actually looking at spirits. So there's people who have passed on in a bad way or a hard way. So that could mean a suicide, or it could be a murder, or something in a bad way. So that's what、um, Klinga people believe in. And sometimes when you look up, sometimes it almost looks like a circle. And it, to me, it looks like people are holding hands, and it looks like they're dancing in a circle. And we say that's our ancestors. And so、um, those ancestors, because they died in a bad, hard way, their spirits get lonely. And so therefore, they want company. They want to take somebody from the earth to come with them, and so they could come down and take you. If you look at them or you draw attention, that's why we say never whistle at them. So that's what Grandma told me, and I'm like, I'm not going to argue with Grandma. She's the boss. That was Sharon Shorty recalling what her grandmother told her about the Northern Lights. It was produced by Catherine Barton and CBC North. Hi, I'm Leah, and I'm Phelan. You know us as the hosts of the podcast, The Secret Life of Canada, and we've got an exciting bit of news for you. We do. We want to go to school with you. That's right. We are now part of the curriculum in a way. We've teamed up with educators from across the country to create teaching guides that go along with some of our best episodes. We've got teaching guides for Indigenous history,、uh, Caribbean Canadian migration,、um, Black history. Just head to CBC. dot ca slash teaching guides for more info, and it's free. It's free. Hi, I'm Michelle Shepard, host of Uncover Charmini from CBC Podcasts. In 1999, 15-year-old Charmini Anandavale disappeared on her way to a job that police believed didn't exist. Four months later, her remains were found in a wooded ravine. I revisit the case that has stayed with me for over 20 years, ever since I first covered it as a cub crime reporter for the Toronto Star. You can find Uncover Charmini on CBC Listen or on your favorite podcast app. You may have heard the expression "We come from the stars." My next guest translated that into dance. Sandra Laurent is the founder of Red Sky Performance, an Indigenous dance, theater, and music company. Sandra is Timiagama Anishinaabe, and she's created and directed a performance inspired by Anishinaabe sky and star stories. The production is called Trace. It's been performed throughout Canada, and the international tour is scheduled to start in the fall of 2021. Sandra, welcome. Thank you so much, Phelan. So your performance is called Trace, and I'm wondering about the significance of that word. How does it connect to the stars? Well, when I first started thinking about、uh, the project, I was thinking about all things traceable because I thought that could be really fun. You know, trace as in our DNA. Trace as in a thumbprint, a footprint,、um, all the things that are traceable. Tracing a call, and、uh, then I was thinking, oh, it's interesting, trace. But trace has to come from somewhere because it's a trace, so it has to go back to source somewhere. It has to go back to an origin. And I thought, oh, so this is actually going to be a piece about origin because it goes back to source, and all trace does. So that's how it ended up. Being about、uh, sky and star stories, because as Anishinaabe people, we call ourselves a star people. So I thought it would be really great to tell that story of our origin. So Trace is about Anishinaabe star and sky stories, and I, I've heard that Indigenous astrophysicists and astronomers came into the studio when you were working on it. So, what was that process like for creating this dance piece? It sounds pretty unconventional. Yes. We like the unconventional. <laughs>、um, we invited people into the dance studio: indigenous astronomers and an astrophysicist and an astrobiologist. And it was just to hear up close and personal the the star and sky stories, and and then sort of take that into the studio, let the dancers hear that, and then start to create some. Improvisations. It really made me realize, you know, we're in school and we're learning about Greek and Roman mythology and Orion and Orion's belt. Why are we learning those stories? Why is Canada learning those stories? Why is the Nishnabe or as Indigenous people 
are we learning Greek and Roman stories of the night sky, which are basically kind of like the stories of the soul. Like they're really, really a mirror of who we are. And, and so they're really important stories. Why aren't we learning the indigenous perspective of the night sky? Why don't Canadians know that? We're, we're not looking at the sky in the same way that uh, one would if they were in Greece or in Italy or somewhere else, because it would look different here. So let's tell that story. And so that's what we're uh, very interested in doing. So the performance starts with Sky Woman. For those who don't know who she is, can you explain who she is and why it was important for you to start there? Because we start there. We start there. Uh, Gijiko Kwe, uh, Sky Woman, is um, a woman that comes through the hole in the sky or a portal, if you will. will. It's like a tunnel. You know, almost think of like sort of a, a worm that eats its way through an apple and that sort of tunnel you know, it's, it's kind of that hole that she falls through in the sky. So it's a, it's a portal, it's a wormhole, it's, um, it's the, the hole in the sky that is actually there. And that's from, from where she fell to earth. And um, with her, she uh, brings the gift of life. When she was falling from the sky, with her came the shaft of, of dazzling light with her because a light came from the other side and the world was in darkness at that time. So she fell for a very, 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 very long time. And um, they say they say a very long time, <laughs> or some people say an eternity, but it's it's her falling through the sky. And if you can imagine, you know, this sort of black billowing hair and you know, falling and falling. And she grabbed the branches and the seeds and the medicines in her hands as she fell from the other world, from the sky world and into this world. And she brought those gifts as well as uh, life in her belly uh, to the world. So that's how we start the piece. And so she's held up sort of on other dancers are holding her up and she's twirling. You actually see her spiraling, twirling and falling. And then the light is just focused on her. And she sort of comes out of this hole that you see that turns later into a moon and a sun and stars. So she starts there and then she slowly comes down to earth. And then, of course, we do this whole dance all the way down to earth. On, and then when her feet touch the ground. So that's how it opens. It's beautiful. Yeah, and I can see that that journey would really lend itself well to, to dance. I could, just the way that you're describing it, I can, I can, I can almost see it. So there are seven dancers in Trace, and throughout the performance, there are these vivid large-scale images on the screen and on the stage, you know, all of these motion graphics that are changing as the dancers move, uh, images of constellations and of the Milky Way. So what is the significance of the Milky Way in this piece and to you? Well, the Milky Way to us as Anishinaabe people is um, the spirit path or the river of life, people call it as well. And it's where we go back to, because we go back to the stars and we travel along that Milky Way. And I have to say, so much is inspired from what we do at Red Sky, from what I do at Red Sky, is so inspired from land and from growing up in Tomogamy and, and um, you know, all the stars. And we see that where I'm from in Tomogamy, uh, all the time. And it's so glorious. It's so beautiful. You know, I, I've been camping up there when I was a kid with my dad. He liked to go camping around there. So yes, I can attest, I can second that fact that the sky is very beautiful around Tomogamy. So you mentioned that Anishinaabe people are star people. Uh, what does that mean to you, you know, to say Anishinaabe are star people? I know it's a quote uh, in sort of the Western canon uh, we are the stuff of stars, but it's very much part of the indigenous canon as well. And to break that down even further, Anishinaabe canon, which is that uh, we believe we come from there. Life is cyclical and we will go back there when we pass on into spirit and into the other world. And um, we're made up of some of the same ingredients as a star, 
that we, we share as humans some of the same alchemy that a star has. You know, so truly, we are the stuff of stars. And that's phen- phenomenal when you think about that. The other thing that I love about our star stories is that they're not just stories that remain in the sky. They're actually, there's a practical application of the stars in a, in a way because it, it tells the time to hunt. And of course, it's a navigational piece that we navigate uh, by the stars. And when you think about ancient astronomers or indigenous astronomers, and you know, it's, it's amazing that, first of all, you can see the patterns in the sky, but also being able to navigate you know, on bodies of water or by land by, by the sky and by the North Star, and that they're a guide. And we also think about the night sky as a mirror. I love that. What do you mean by that? Well, when we look up at the stars, you know, you can imagine the imaginations of our peoples and all peoples around the world. And I'll speak more to Indigenous peoples and Anishinaabe peoples is, you know, we basically create stories by looking at the stars through the constellation. They're sort of this holder of our stories in a way. So it's really coming out of our our psyche, out of our cultural psyche, and we're projecting in a way ourselves onto the stars, or are the stars projecting themselves onto us? Well, Sandra, thank you for taking the time to chat with us today. I'm definitely going to be uh, looking up tonight as I go for my evening walk. I hope so. Me too. Thank you. Miigwech. That was Sandra LaRonde. She's the founder of Red Sky Performance. The International Tour of Trace is scheduled to start in the fall of 2021. To learn more about Sandra's work and about her star-inspired production, you can head to our website, cbc.ca slash unreserved. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. The time time has come. come. Red Red Rover, Rover. we're We're calling calling you you over. over. That's a clip from Métis filmmaker Shane Belcourt's latest film, Red Rover. Shane co-wrote Red Rover with his friend, Dwayne Murray. Red Rover is a romantic comedy feature film that is about a real-life event that occurred probably about five years ago in which a program called Mars One, it was an entrepreneur decided to see if they could colonize Mars through people applying who would get a one-way trip. And so Red Rover is a sort of play on that. What would it be and what kind of people would apply to go to a one-way trip to colonize Mars? When we first started watching these Mars One applicant videos, It was because we were looking for the crazy. We actually wanted to laugh at it. We were thinking, this is who would apply to a one-way trip to Mars? Who are these people? And we started watching these videos, and it kind of dawned on us for Dwayne and I were watching them. These people are very much like ourselves. And that was something that was kind of striking. At first, we wanted to ridicule them. And then we started seeing ourselves in them, in the sense that there are these people that They're not lost, but they're just kind of wishing and hopeful and yearning for something, some greater connection to something bigger than themselves. That's when we kind of realize, you know, we are these applicants. We see ourselves as applicants. And suddenly what we thought would be this crazy thing we could laugh at felt like, no, this is something that we could actually write a film about, a tender film about a character who is one of those applicants who discovers and tries to get to the root cause of why do I want to escape my own life? Damon is the movie's protagonist. He's a lonely geologist trying to qualify for a one-way mission to Mars. The movie follows Damon's hope for interplanetary travel and his own internal journey. We're using Mars One, this real-life program, as our inspiration. And we really copped a lot of the language that truly existed in the Mars One program when we created this sort of fake ad. Exploration is essential for human survival. Single planet species cannot survive forever. Just as we as a species left to explore and settle other continents, the Red Rover mission aims to expand 
on this human need for exploration, for new lands, new horizons. Red Rover is about the search for meaning through space travel. But the film also makes connections between space exploration and colonization. The term colonization and space travel was... How it came up was actually quite shocking because it, it was just so blatant. It was right there in the literature of the Mars One program. And it was just, come help us colonize Mars. Be the first people to colonize Mars. Even, you know, the maps that they have of, of like, of how we're going to exist in these bubbles and then we're going to, maybe we drop an atomic bomb, seriously, uh, to create atmosphere on Mars. Maybe that's a solution. It was total, let's just get there and dominate it and make it work for our species now. Let's colonize it. Not from a place of let's evolve our species, like how could we evolve to exist in, in a place like Mars? It was, no, 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 no. We're going to go and completely alter that place to look like what we want it to be from our perspective now, which is kind of what Europe wanted to do when they went into the Americas. It was like, how do we go colonize that place? Not to see how those people and those, all those living nations exist and coexist on you know that land. Let's just go turn it into what we have in Europe. There, good, solved. And that seems to be what, you know, in terms of Mars One program and even what the language that some people when they, at NASA speak about going exploration. How do we colonize planets, even the moon, to set up colonies to have it work for us, our species only? What I hope people get out of Red Rover, I mean, first it sounds kind of a selfish thing, but I hope people go along for the ride of the story and the characters and they have a laugh and uh, they feel the feels that as the characters are struggling with things. And But ultimately, just like the lead character, Damon, discovers or rediscovers the profoundness of being here, of being on Earth, of being with other human beings and relationships of all the nations and the life that is here, which is so profound and expansive that to look out into space should be the inspiration to look inward and to find those connections of the living universe in ourselves and around us right here on earth. This is the most profound place to be. This is the most profound place to know ourselves through relationships and it's ultimately a hopeful story about rediscovering how beautiful life is on Earth. The technology has evolved. It is not a matter of how. It's only a question of when. Really, the only question that truly remains is who. Will you be taking that step with us? That was Shane Belcourt, director and co-writer of the feature film Red Rover. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence starts. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the, the big hour. rocket now. Liftoff moving up, moving up. The flame spreading out over the launch area. The rocket now clearing the launch tower. You can hear the roar, and we can feel the vibrations. Three miles That's away. the sound of the Apollo 11 lifting off in 1969. Many remember watching that launch on their TVs, and remember seeing Neil Armstrong take the first steps on the moon. My next guest certainly does. John Harrington is an astronaut, and he's an enrolled member of the Chickasaw Nation. In 2002, John was the first Native American to travel to space. John, welcome. Well, thank you so much. My pleasure. So I'd like to take you back in time a bit. Do you remember when you first wanted to become an astronaut? Well, the, uh, the launch you just provided is uh, exactly the time that I was playing astronaut laying in a cardboard box, you know, dreaming I was going to the moon. So 1968, 1967, I think, was the time that uh, really uh, I had this dream of being an astronaut, but I never thought I could actually accomplish it. 
You struggled a bit in school, and you weren't always the best student. But after a lot of very hard work, years as a naval pilot, getting a Master of Science degree in aeronautical engineering, you were selected by NASA to be an astronaut. And in 2002, you were ready for takeoff. For those of us who haven't been to space, what was your first launch like? What did it feel like? Well, it's, um, I was fortunate to spend about two and a half years of my career actually working at the Kennedy Space Center, helping strap other crews in uh, to the space shuttle and to actually pat them on the head and close the hatch. And so the first time I actually got to do it you know, for my, my own, to climb on board, uh, I had been through this process watching others. And so I was comfortable in that. But then once you strap in and they close the hatch and you're on the inside, not the outside, it does take on a whole different flavor. And then once inside of you know, nine minutes from liftoff, you're much more focused because before that, you're not really doing much anything, just kind of laying on your back. We were playing word games. I think one of the guys fell asleep. You could hear him snoring on the on the ICS. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and and then inside of nine minutes, you know, you're very focused. My job was was a flight engineer. I sat on the flight deck. About 30 seconds prior to launch, I thought, I'm actually going to space. <laughs> I'm actually going. You know, you became the first Native American to travel to space. Were you aware of this when you were, you know, training to to go to space? Was this something that, you know, you were actively working towards? I found out about it when I first got to NASA. I did not, you know, it wasn't as actively working towards. I got to NASA and one of the uh, women, Estella Gillette was her name, worked in the Equal Opportunity Office at uh, the Johnson Space Center. You know, came to me one day and said, well, you're a member of the, of the Chickasaw Nation. I said, yes, ma'am. And, and she goes, well, we have a bunch of kids coming down from the uh, Alabama Cushata Reservation. You're the first Native American astronaut we've had. And would you be willing to meet with them? And I said, I am. <laughs> I said, okay. And and so I had this chance really to be in a role that I'd never, that someone had not been in before. And it gave me a chance to meet with students and meet with kids that never had a role model in that, in that uh, position. I just, I took it very serious. I mean, I was very dedicated to this, to a role that I had to, you know, to make really, I could make a difference in somebody's life, I felt. And it was a, it's a huge, I think a huge responsibility. Well, and I know that, you know, being a role model and representation and all of that is is important for so many Indigenous people, um, you know, who end up in positions like the position you're in um, or have been in. You know, I've seen photos of you floating in a spaceship, but I've also seen you with items that you brought with you to space, you know, like a, like an eagle feather or a, a flute or, or even the, the uh, Chickasaw Nation flag. So, you know, why were these items important for you to bring to space? Well, every astronaut has the opportunity to fly a variety of things. And my commander said, um, there's only two things you can take, you can actually take out. Everything else is kind of stowed in the in the space shuttle. You can't get to it. But there's two things. Take take two things that you'll take out that, that are significant to you. And so the two for me were the eagle feather. It was presented to me by an elder with the American Indian Science and Engineering Society. And then the flute was made by a Cherokee friend who was an engineer at the Kennedy Space Center, a guy named Jim Gillian beautiful, uh, makes beautiful flutes. And he taught me how to make one. He taught me how to play one. And so I took it, uh, I took that on orbit as well. And actually played, uh, I played that on the space station, uh, when I was up there and there's a video of that somewhere. What did you play? I played, I played Amazing Grace because my understanding was that for the Trail of Tears, that this was like a, uh, this is a very comforting song that folks had used during the Trail of Tears. And so I played that. And then, uh, my friend Don Pettit, who actually, um, he took up a didgeridoo. He took up an Aboriginal oh. uh, instrument, uh, but he had it packed away. And so instead of playing a didgeridoo, he pulled out a vacuum cleaner hose. And he started playing a vacuum cleaner <laughs> hose like a didgeridoo. And so here I'm playing the flute, and Don's playing this vacuum cleaner hose. And for what me was going to be a very solemn moment, and somebody filmed it, it, it kind of came off a little bit different because my uh, Mike L.A., my, uh, my spacewalking partner and crewmate, uh, he comes floating down the hatch from the Russian side, and he pops into the into the area where we're playing, and here's Don on this hose and me on my flute, and this, he breaks out in this sh- huge grin. I mean, he just starts cracking up, up, and so it was a solemn moment for a few moments. <laughs> oh, wow, <laughs> it's pretty neat. Um, so, you are also an author. Um, you wrote a kids' book about being an astronaut, and it's called Mission to Space. And we were hoping that you could read a bit for us. Well, you know, that's a great. I've got that book right here. Stand by. I'm Commander John B. Harrington, and I am Chickasaw. Flying in space takes a lot of training. 
I trained in a virtual reality laboratory. I trained in a pool called the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory. It takes a lot of hard work to do something well. And soon, I was ready to fly to the International Space Station with my fellow astronauts. While we waited in the shuttle, there was a very important celebration happening at the Rocket Garden at the Kennedy Space Center. Chickasaw Nation Governor Bill Anatubby and Lieutenant Governor Jefferson Keel presented a Chickasaw blanket to NASA. People came from miles away to sing and dance and to celebrate. The rockets ignite with a great shudder and we blast off into orbit around Earth. The International Space Station will be our home for the next two weeks. So, you know, you you talked a bit about the language in the book. Why did you feel like it was important to you to include it? I think so. I didn't grow up speaking the language. You know, my great grandmother, um, I didn't I didn't grow up in Oklahoma. I moved away very early, so I didn't have the opportunity. But also my great grandmother spoke the language fluently, but she didn't speak it to accept people her own age. Uh, for whatever reason, she chose not to to pass along that knowledge and, and not having been around her, you know, on a daily basis. Like a, like a lot of you know kids growing up are fortunate they get to be around their elders uh, that that have that knowledge pass that knowledge down. I didn't so come uh, come to it much later in life and I, I think it's important that you have a connection to. And I'm still learning language. I know so very little of it, uh, but what I do know, you know, I'm, I'm I'm glad I know it and then, you know, I want to learn more. You no longer travel in space, but you do dedicate a lot of your time working to encouraging indigenous kids and youth to go into STEM education, you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So, you know, why is this important to you and and what do you hope to see? Well, I'm just, I'm fortunate that somebody came along in my life and encouraged me to do something I didn't initially think I was capable of doing. And if they had not made that effort, then we would not be having this conversation. And, I, and I'm very uh, cognizant of that fact. And so I know that if I can go out and share my experience with others and they can say, well, hey, that guy didn't really, he wasn't a very stellar student early on, but he figured it out. And so maybe that can give somebody else the encouragement and the motivation, you know. Um, and I, I tell folks, you know, our ancestors were phenomenal engineers and scientists. They were botanists. They were astrophysicists. I mean, they were, they knew the stars. They, they looked up and, you know, maybe not exactly what they were, but they knew the patterns and they knew how it related to their lives. And so, you know, our ancestors um, built remarkable structures, solved problems that allowed them to survive to this day. And so I'm grateful that my ancestors gave me the opportunity to walk the earth and maybe at one time fly above it. Um, and it's my responsibility, I think, to share that with others. And like I called my friend that one day and thanked him for encouraging me to go back to school. Uh, I met a, a young lady in Arizona once. She said, uh, we're in an elevator. And she goes, you're John Harrington. I'm like, uh-huh. <laughs> I, no, doesn't, that doesn't happen to me. And she goes, I met you when I was 12 years old at uh, a summer camp at uh, Fort Lewis College, a Navajo summer camp. And she said, I didn't realize I could be an engineer until I met you. And she says, I want to thank you because I'm now an engineer with the city of San Francisco. I think she was a civil engineer. And so here was somebody that I'd never, you know, that I'd met in passing that looked at me and said, well, hey, if that, he can do that, why can't I? And, and she went on to a successful career as an engineer. Those moments must be so uh, so massive for you. It's a neat feeling. I mean, really, I mean, we all should, to recognize you made a difference in somebody's life that was not somebody directly connected to you. I mean, wow. I mean, how, that's powerful. That's a very that powerful is. thing. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time today, John. It's been great talking to you. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time to Kind of share some stories. That was Chickasaw astronaut John Harrington. He's the author of the children's book, Mission to Space. To learn more about John's work, you can head to our website, cbc.ca slash unreserved. That's it for this week's episode of Unreserved. If you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at unreserved at cbc.ca or find us on Facebook or Twitter. Unreserved is produced by Zoe Tennant, Kyle Muzika, Stephanie Cram, and Anna Lazowski. I'm Phelan Johnson. Now go for listening. For more CBC Podcasts, go to cbc.ca slash podcasts.